Good morning, and welcome to the Lord's House for worship today. It's good to be with you as we're worshiping via the web stream, and wherever you are today, I ask God's blessings to be upon each and every one of you. As we move into this season of worship, I hope that you found a copy of the worship order on the website. There you will be able to follow along through the different worship elements today. As far as announcements go, just a few I'd like to share with you as quick as possible. The Circle for Christ meeting, which was originally scheduled for tomorrow night on the 14th, that has been postponed until a week from tomorrow, so that is now on Monday the 21st. Please keep in mind our Nehemiah Bible study. If you would like any of the handouts, I have all of those uploaded to the internet through Nehemiah 6. I've also printed some copies that are now available in the church conference room, and you should be able to find all of the videos up through chapter 5 available through the website and the Facebook group. This week we will be looking at Nehemiah chapter 6. As I shared last week during our announcements, the Christian Education Board is in the process of putting together the Wednesday night meal teams for when we are able to resume our full Wednesday night schedule. If you would be willing to serve with one of those teams, please be sure to contact Charlie Walburn, and I have her contact number there in your worship order. If you need to sign up, to be a sponsor for yard maintenance, for housekeeping, or would like to give flowers during the worship service at any time during this coming year, we do have the sign-up notebooks which are available in the church conference room. Marcy, anything that you need to share? Anyone else? One other little item as we prepare to worship. I do want to give you an update on our 2021 bridge builder contributions or as we move from 2021 into 2022. It's been a couple of years since we've been able to have the official bridge builder dinner for the University of Mount Olive but this year we were able to have 21 donors and a total of $4,700 in contributions to benefit the University of Mount Olive. At this time, let us now prepare our hearts and our minds as we worship our God together. of call to worship. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. Their, Their descendants, descendants will be mighty in the, in the land. land. The, the generation, generation of the upright will be blessed. blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with, just, with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. Let us join together in the prayer that our Lord and Savior taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. The gospel reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. Mark 12, 41 through 44. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on, <coughs> the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be unto God. God. As we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer this morning, I call our attention to our weekly prayer list. You'll find this in your order of worship. You'll also find it in your monthly newsletter. We have had many needs close to our church family and community over the past several weeks. As I shared on the phone call just about an hour ago, we remember the family of Mrs. Geraldine Boyette as she went to be with our Lord and Savior about 12.30 this morning. And as I shared on the call as well, we will have a celebration of her life coming up in a couple of weeks. Once those details have been finalized, I'll be sure to pass those along to our church family. We want to continue to remember those hospitalized, including Kathy Watson, also Jake Lucas, we remember Judy Best as she had a quick trip to Rex on Friday, but she was able to come home yesterday. We remember Sally Davis as she's a little bit under the weather this weekend. We remember Tim Wiggs. He and Beth have recovered from pneumonia and bronchitis, and Tim found out middle of this past week he has a fractured foot, so he's going to be taking it easy for a few weeks. We also want to remember the family of Jimmy Rollins. This is Marcy's uncle. We remember also the families of James Radford, Doug Holland, Gary Joyner, and Jimmy Ham. Are there other names, other needs that are close to you this morning? Our first cousin, Virginia Isler, is uh, dealing with cancer. Virginia Isler. Isler, I-S-L-E-R. Right? Virginia Isler. No doubt there are other needs that are close to your hearts and minds. Please be aware that God sees each and every hurt. And God understands the depths of our needs no matter what. Would you bow with me for a time of prayer? Lord, it was the kind of moment where we could have heard a pin drop. Or in this case, a couple of pennies. It seems so insignificant compared to the other gifts that will be given to the temple treasury that day, but you came out and said that hers was far superior to those of others. It may not have had the same monetary value, but Lord, it was important because it was given with the right attitude, the right motivation. Lord, that's the kind of attitude we should have when we think about what it means to be a generous people to share what we have been blessed with, to be a blessing and benefit to other people. Lord, it doesn't matter what we have or don't have. We know that you were capable of touching our hearts and enabling us to use our resources to encourage, to love, to remind people that they are not forsaken, they are not forgotten in your sight. Enable us, Lord, as a church family and as individual believers to be a generous people each and every day. Help us to be selfless and sacrificial with our resources. Lord, we are so thankful for the multitude of blessings you provide us with daily. We know that we do not deserve your goodness and your mercies, which are new each and every day, but we are so truly thankful and overwhelmed by how you meet our needs, how you strengthen us for this journey of faith, 
and how you promise to always be with us regardless of what the future may have in store. Today we have shared the names of so many within this church family and community who are hurting. Many have been hospitalized for a number of days, if not weeks. We think of families who are now grieving at the passing of loved ones. We think of those who are dealing with short-term sicknesses and others who have been recently diagnosed with long-term illnesses. Lord, from day to day, we never know what we may encounter in this life, but we have the great assurance that you will stand beside us, walk with us, and even carry us when our resources are just about depleted. Lord, hear the prayers of your servants this day as we entrust these names, these needs, the families they represent before your throne of grace, knowing that all things are possible through you. And now, Lord, continue with us in this season of worship and be with us as we leave this time together and go back out into the world in a few moments where we will find ourselves in a mission field, a mission field that needs to hear the good news in both word and deed each and every day. God, we love you. We thank you for meeting us in this time together. May everything we do and say be a blessing to your name and glorify your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name that we offer this prayer. Bless me. Jesus and I know He's mine, He's mine. 
Generosity comes in many forms. Our time, our help, our kindness, and our resources. But here's what we know the Bible teaches us. When God's blessing comes to us, it must also go through us. So, what would it look like for you this year to be generous? A timely gift? A helping hand? An act of kindness? Prosperity isn't meant to raise our standard of living, but to raise our standard of giving. Abundance isn't meant for us to live in luxury, but for us to help others live. And generosity isn't just something God wants from us, but something God wants for us. When Jesus came to save the world, he didn't ask, what can I spare? Instead, he asked, what will it take? So, what would it look like for you this year to be generous? Please join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed in unison. Let us begin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Church Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our sermon text for today is taken once again from the book of Nehemiah. And this morning we'll be focusing on chapter 5, verses 14 through 19. Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 14 through 19. To begin this year of 2022, we've been looking at a series of messages taken from the book of Nehemiah reminding us that even as we've been through a time of pandemic the past two years, and even though we look at our world from a cultural standpoint, and we see that many things have changed over the course of times, that we as the people of God still have a place in this world. God still has a role for the church to take on each and every day to make God's love known, to expand God's kingdom until Christ should come again. Sometimes it's discouraging, and sometimes it's just plain disheartening to look at the church of today, to look at the world situation and to wonder, are we making a difference? Are we having any kind of impact whatsoever? And if we are having an impact, is it really all that noticeable? Is it all that significant? When we read the story of Nehemiah from start until finish, we find that his story is one of many highs and lows. It's the story of a man whose heart was broken because of the condition of his people. But it was also the story of a man who was willing to roll up his sleeves, to go above and beyond and do what was necessary to help God's people bounce back from the time of Babylonian captivity, to rebuild the city walls of Jerusalem, and to lead them into a new day under God's lordship and leadership. 
Today we continue in that theme as you have probably already noticed in the scripture reading from Mark chapter 12, the video clip of a few moments ago, even some of the things that I said in this morning's pastoral prayer. We're focusing today upon generosity. And generosity doesn't call for certain times, places, or seasons. Generosity is something that can characterize the people of God anytime, anywhere, in big ways, but so many times in small ways that we so often take for granted. May we give ear to the reading of Holy Scripture as found in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 5, beginning at verse 14. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be the governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens upon the people and took food and wine from them, besides 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I devoted myself to the work on this wall and acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 people, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations around us. Now that which was prepared for one day was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowls were prepared for me, and every ten days skins of wine in abundance. Yet with all of this I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because of the heavy burden on the people. Remember, for my good, my God, all that I have done for this people. May God add a blessing to this, the reading, hearing, understanding, and living of these words for our days. Amen. It was a rather unusual kind of request, but her wishes were granted. Back in 2019, Catherine Andrews passed away at the age of 97. And she was buried next to her husband. Now, her husband had passed away back in the year 2000. Her husband, Wade, had been gone for nearly 20 years upon her passing, but during that span of time, it gave Catherine plenty of time to think about her life. Back when Wade passed away in 2000, she was meeting with her children, and they were making preparations for his service of remembrance. They sat down and selected photos, and they told stories, and they began to think about some things that summarized Wade's life that would be suitable for the grave headstone. In the midst of all of that conversing way back when and some conversation that took place even after Wade's passing, Catherine was asked one day by one of the children, Mother, what would you like included on your side of the tombstone one day? Without hardly missing a beat, Catherine chimed up, I want it to have my famous fudge recipe. A recipe for fudge. What a way to be remembered. According to one of the children, Catherine enjoyed entertaining people. She loved to write poetry, but she also enjoyed to cook. And on many occasions when she would get together with friends or family, she would make a couple of batches of fudge. If you go on the internet, you'll find photos of that fudge recipe. It's garnered a lot of attention over these past couple of years, but it's a wonderful tribute to who she was. And even though she left this world, and even though we may have never known Catherine Andrews personally, what an example 
What a source of joy that has lived on even beyond her physical years in this life. That's enough to make you smile in the midst of these days, isn't it? It brings a little joy, happiness back to our hearts when we think about the difficulties of our world today, and that's a wonderful way to pick up our spirits. But certainly the question posed by Mrs. Andrews' children should be one that we consider as well. What is it that we would like to have included upon our grave headstone? Or to pose that question slightly differently, how do we wish for others to remember us? It's probably not something that we pause all that frequently to think about. After all, we want to live life and enjoy it to its fullest as long as it will last. Thinking about our own mortality, well, that's just morbid. Who wants to live life while thinking about death? But there is a realization we must make. It comes at some point in time. As Benjamin Franklin said late in his life, there are but two certainties in this world, death and taxes. One day we will leave this world behind. Our body will be placed in the ground, and with it we will leave all kinds of memories of things that we have made, things that we've done, things that we've said or contributed. And from that, our legacy will continue on. But what will be said for us? It's interesting to read these words at this point in Nehemiah because Nehemiah wasn't sitting around thinking about end-of-life issues. He wasn't consulting with his children about funeral plans for some time down the road. He wasn't working upon what would be etched into his grave headstone. He was focusing upon the needs of God's people at that particular point in time. And it's an interesting petition with which chapter 5 concludes. There, Nehemiah calls to the Lord, Remember my good work, God, all that I have done for this people. Did you get that? It's kind of unusual because to hear those words coming from Nehemiah at this stage may seem a little bit egotistical on the part of Nehemiah. We might have overheard Nehemiah's petition and said, Well, gee, Nehemiah, use a little bit of humility. Or, look at Nehemiah. He's thinking all of the things that he has done so well. You would think he did all of the work. Maybe he's trying to earn extra credits with God. It's possible. But maybe when we read it that way or we hear those words in such a way as that, we miss a lot of the point. Those could be ways to consider, but maybe this scripture invites us to hear Nehemiah's petition a little bit differently. Maybe we need to hear them as words from a man who had a deep prayer life, who was fully committed to the faith of his people, and who often pondered the significance of his life. Maybe in this prayer it's not about a works righteousness or personal pride. Maybe... Just maybe this is the prayer of a man who longs for his life to be one of significance, for his life to count for something. But when you look at the story of Nehemiah, you find that something was not just any and everything. It wasn't just any old calls that came down the pipeline. No, specifically... His cause wasn't even about his own benefit. 
to look at Nehemiah and his life and making a life that was significant, it wasn't about him and his achievements. It was all about remembering what he did for the blessing of other people. To read the story of Nehemiah from start to finish, we find that he was very much an others-centered kind of individual. What a great way to be remembered because of his character at the very beginning all the way through the culmination of the book at Nehemiah 13. We find that Nehemiah's heart was very much in tune with God, with the concerns, the challenges of the people. Back in chapter 1, his heart was broken to the point of tears and prayer of confession and a desire to go and to make a difference in the land of Judah. In chapter 2 of Nehemiah, he goes before King Artaxerxes with a heavy heart and a heavy mind, and he requests to go back to the land of his ancestors to be involved in the regrouping and rebuilding process in the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah in that time acted in ways that showed sincere concern for other people. And that's the kind of life that God invites us to even today, even in troubling times, even in a dark and desperate world, we still have the capability of making a difference and having a positive impact in the midst of all of the negativity. When you look at the present context, the passage I read just moments ago, Nehemiah thinks about the things that he did at that time to touch the lives of others. Now what we know of Nehemiah's story, he was the cupbearer of the king. He had a good association with the leader of the Persian Empire. He was certainly able to get permission and resources from King Artaxerxes to go back and rebuild in the land of Judah. When you think about a person like that, you might think, well, Nehemiah could have covered himself. He could have looked out for his own skin. He could have done what was necessary to keep himself safe and comfortable, rebuild a house for himself, let everybody else do the work that they needed to do on their own. Forget about the city walls. Forget about the conditions that people were living through following the devastation by the Babylonians. Let's just focus upon Nehemiah and making sure that Nehemiah has a good living after going back to the remnants of Judah. But that's not the way Nehemiah was. He had all of those resources at his disposal, yet he channeled, channeled them to the good of other people. He allowed God to take what he had been blessed with abundantly and multiply it so that other people experienced relief and safety and the provision of needs. It's what we call in our world today generosity. Generosity doesn't look out for what other people can do for us. Rather, it asks the question, where can I be of the most benefit to someone else? To read what we just did from Nehemiah 5, we may even think to ourselves, well, Nehemiah, he could do it. He could afford it. We don't know a lot about Nehemiah's background with the exception of being the king's cupbearer. Maybe it paid very well. Maybe he came from a wealthy family that still had some land or something back in the land of Judah. We don't know what was the source of all of his means, but he took that means and he gave it. And in today's text, he fed people. And he did what was necessary not to add any more to the burdens of the situation there in Judah. 
Now we may think to ourselves, if I were someone else, if I were the son of the president, if I were the daughter of a CEO, maybe if I had married into a well-to-do family, or who knows, maybe one day if I hit the jackpot, if I really make it big, then I'll be able to do something significant. Then I'll be able to give like Nehemiah. Then I can make an impact in the world. But if we're honest, it's not about all that, is it? Generosity is not a matter of what we have or don't have. Generosity is a matter of our heart. In this passage, when describing the motivation for his actions, Nehemiah stated that he did so out of his fear for God. His fear for God. Instead of manipulating the situation, instead of abusing resources that he may have been entitled to, his fear... For God, his relationship, his understanding of who God was and how God had related to him in his own life and how God was relating to Judah and allowing them to go back and rebuild shaped his generosity. He was generous because he could say without a doubt, our God is generous. When you and I have a reverence for God, things change in our lives as well. We begin to see people a little differently. We start to do things differently. We take note of situations where people are down and out and struggling to get by. We treat people not as possessions that we want to control. In fact, we don't even treat our own personal possessions as things that we want to cling to in life. We take what we've been blessed with, what we've been graced with, and we say, God, it is yours. I'm using it for your glory. My, how things change. Our attitude changes. Our priorities change. And yes, even our world can change when we seek to live lives that are generous. This is true for all of us. People from all backgrounds, all walks of life, those who were very well off and we would call some of the very wealthy within society, but even those people who have hardly a thing within this world, those individuals are still capable of having an impact through a generous spirit. The difference is one of perspective and what it is that makes for a good life. Generous individuals count their blessings and name them one by one. They express gratitude for God's provision in their lives each and every day, and they question not what can be done for them, but how they might be of good to someone else. Author Sebastian Junger shares a story. He's well known for his book, The Perfect Storm, but he shares of an experience back before he became a well-known author, before he was selling books and his name became popular. He decided at a time in life that he was going to embark upon a little bit of adventure. That adventure, you might ask, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't engage in it. But his adventure, his idea of fun for that span of time was to hitchhike his way across the United States. He found himself in Gillette, Wyoming, following a blizzard. And while he was there standing on the side of an interstate, a man walked up to him who was dressed in dingy coveralls and carrying a worker's style lunchbox, lunch pail. He said the closer the man got, he noticed other things about his features, how he was unkept, specifically his hair, which was matted in such a way that it had not seen any significant attention in many months. 
Junger admits that he was nervous about this man, not knowing what he was capable of. But even the closer he got, the man started to speak, and he asked a series of questions of Junger. Where are you going? Have you been out here long? Have you got anything to eat? From here, I'll use Junger's own words to tell the rest of the story. Junger said, I thought about the situation. Clearly, he didn't have any food, and if I admitted that I did, he'd ask me for some. That in itself wasn't the problem, but it would mean opening my backpack and revealing all of my obviously expensive camping gear. I felt alone and exposed and ripe for pillage, and I just didn't want to go through all of that. Twenty years later, I still remember my answer. I got some cheese. You won't make it to California with just cheese. You'll starve to death. At first, I didn't understand. And as he continued to talk, I kept my hand upon my can of pepper spray, not knowing how this may turn out. The man said, believe me, I know. Listen, I've been living in a car back in town, and every day I walk out to the mine to see if they need me. Today, they didn't, so I won't be needing this lunch of mine. I began to sag with understanding. In his world, whatever you have in your bag is all you've got, and he knew a little cheese would never get me to California. I'm fine, really, I said. I don't need your lunch. I appreciate the generosity. But the man shook his head and opened up his box. It was a typical church-style meal, a bologna sandwich, an apple, and a bag of chips. I kept protesting, but he wouldn't hear of it. Finally, I took his lunch, and I watched him walk back down the on-ramp toward town. At that point, I had learned a lot of things in college. I had learned a lot from reading books on my own. I had learned things in Europe and in Mexico and in my hometown of Belmont, Massachusetts. But it took a moment of me standing out there on a frozen piece of interstate to learn true generosity from a homeless man. No matter who we are, we are capable of making a difference, brothers and sisters. Generosity is in, within the very nature of God. And as a people who represent God within the world and claim the name of Christ, we must embody this same virtue in our lives. We can't be greedy and self-serving, expect to please God. In fact, brothers and sisters, we can't keep everything for ourselves and expect to be happy. We find meaning, purpose, value in life when we do for someone else and we give for God's glory. For some, that may involve a recipe for fudge. For others, it could be something totally different. But the invitation for generosity is for all of us. No matter who we are, no matter from where we have come, no matter what we have or don't have, we can be difference makers. It's not so much important what we leave behind in this life as much as people remembering us for what we gave in this life. It's my hope and my prayer as I close this morning that our desire would be the same as that expressed by John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, in his well-known challenge. Do all the good you can in all the ways you can to all the souls you can in every place that you can at all the times you can with all the zeal you can as long as ever you can. Thanks be unto God. Amen and amen.
Brothers and sisters, it's been good to be with you in this season of worship. It's my hope and my prayer that we will all be a generous people, that we will give as we see the hurts, the concerns, the challenges of so many people. Generosity, as the video reflected this morning, is not just about money. It's about time. It's about talents. It's about being a blessing wherever God sends us in the days to come. Today, I don't know the situation that's upon your heart or your mind, but I serve a God who does understand. If you've never accepted Christ and invited him in to be your personal Lord and Savior, would you do so? The scriptures teach us today can indeed be the day of salvation. Maybe you would like to recommit your life to Christ and maybe specifically to being generous with the things that you have. Perhaps there are burdens that are weighing down upon your hearts or even praises that you would like to celebrate with your Heavenly Father. No matter the need, no matter your situation, God is close and ready and willing to hear as we close in a moment of prayer. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the challenge of Nehemiah, a man who wanted his life to count for something, but not for his own sake. He wanted his life to be a blessing to other people. Lord, we can accumulate so many things in this life and never truly be happy. But Lord, as we discover what it means to give with open hearts, we find our meaning, our place, our purpose in this life. Lord, I pray that would be true for all of us, that we would each and every one seek to be generous individuals and perhaps even more and more each and every day. Lord, we ask that you would bless the tithes and offerings that we will receive this week that you would multiply them for the ongoing ministry of your kingdom here upon earth. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Go in the peace of Jesus Christ.